Everybody, this is Fadila Shaib speaking to you from the uh, Geneva WHO headquarters and welcoming you to our uh, global COVID-19 press conference today, September 25th. On Monday, we briefed you about the COVAX facility part of the COVAX, the vaccine pillar of the access to COVID-19 tools known as ACT Accelerator. Today, we are launching the ACT Accelerator investment case. Um, before we go deep in developing this important uh, aspect, Dr. Tedros, our Director General, will address you first. Joining Dr. Tedros in the room are Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Emergencies Program, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, uh, Dr. Maria Angela Simao, Assistant Director, General Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, uh, Dr. Bruce Elward, Senior Advisor to the Director General, Lead Act Accelerator. Uh, the briefing is being translated uh, simultaneously into the six UN official languages plus uh, Portuguese and Hindi. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Fadila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. With the Northern Hemisphere flu season approaching and with cases and hospitalizations increasing, many countries find themselves struggling to strike the right balance between protecting public health, protecting personal liberty, and protecting their economies. So-called lockdowns and the impact on global travel and trade have already taken such a heavy toll. The global economy is ex expected to contract by trillions of U.S. dollars this year. Many countries have poured money into domestic stimulus packages, but these investments will not on their own address the root cause of the economic crisis, which is the disease that paralyzes health systems, disrupts economies, and drives fear and uncertainty. We continue to urge countries to focus on four essential priorities. First, prevent amplifying events. Second, protect the vulnerable. Third, educate, empower, and enable communities to protect themselves and others using every tool at their disposal. And fourth, get the basics right find, isolate, test, and care for cases, and trace and quarantine their contacts. This is what works. Effective vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics will also be vital for ending the pandemic and accelerating the global recovery. But these life-saving tools will only be effective if they're available for the most vulnerable, equitably, and simultaneously in all countries. The access to COVID-19 tools accelerator is the best bet for spreading, speeding up the development of the tools we need to save lives as fast as possible and to make them available for as many as possible, as equitably as possible. Today, WHO and our partners are publishing a detailed strategic plan and investment case for the urgent scale-up phase of the ACT Accelerator, building on the success of the startup phase. The investment case illustrates some of the considerable economic benefits from accelerating the development and deployment of tools to rapidly reduce the risk of severe COVID-19 disease globally. By the end of next year, the ACT Accelerator aims to deliver 2 billion doses of vaccine, 245 million courses of treatment, and 500 million diagnostic tests to low- and middle-income countries. Today's status report shows that in just five months, the ACT Accelerator has made remarkable progress. The diagnostics pillar is evaluating more than 50 tests, including rapid and accurate diagnostics, and we expect to have more news on that next week. 
The therapeutics pillar is analyzing more than 1,700 clinical trials for promising treatments and has secured courses of dexamethasone for up to 4.5 million patients in lower income countries, the only medicine shown to reduce the risk of death so far. And COVAX, the largest and most varied portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines globally, is supporting the development of nine vaccines and with several more in the pipeline. The number of countries joining the COVAX facility grows every day. As of today, 67 high-income economies have formally joined and another 34 are expected to sign. Joining 92 lower-income countries who are eligible for financial support through Gavi. Investing in COVAX increases the probability of being able to access the best vaccine and hedges the risk that countries that have entered into bilateral agreements end up with products that are not viable. The ACT Accelerator is an unprecedented global effort. Of course, realizing its vision needs investment. The current financing gap for ACT Accelerator stands at 35 billion US dollars. 35 billion dollars is a lot of money, but in the context of arresting a global pandemic and supporting the global economy recovery, it's a bargain. To put it in perspective, 35 billion US dollars is less than 1% of what G20 governments have already committed to domestic economic stimulus packages. Or, to put it another way, it's roughly equivalent to what the world spends on cigarettes every two weeks. Of the $35 billion, $15 billion is needed immediately to fund research and development, scale up manufacturing, secure procurement and strengthen delivery systems. Normally, these steps are done sequentially. We're do doing them all at the same time, so that as soon as a product is ready to go, we can get it to the people who need it immediately. We're not asking for an act of charity. We're asking for an investment in the global recovery. The economic benefits from restoring international travel and trade alone would repay this investment very, very quickly. Next Wednesday, world leaders will meet virtually for a high-level side event during the United Nations General Assembly to discuss the work of the ACT Accelerator and to call for the financial commitments to realize its promise. The window of opportunity is now. We must act now and act together to end COVID-19. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, for your opening remarks. Um, we will now open the floor to questions from journalists. I remind you that you need to raise your hand, use the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue to ask your question. Um, I will now give the floor to uh, Mr. Du Yong from Xinhua. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can, I can Mr. Yong, yeah. or? Can you uh, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you for taking my question. Many world leaders express support for multilateralism at the UNGA. The Chinese president has also reaffirmed the commitment to multilateralism and has stressed that solidarity and cooperation is the most powerful weapon in the face of COVID-19. So the WHO continue to utilize multilateralism to beat the pandemic? Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Young. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Ryan. Um, <clears throat> the World Health Organization uh, was actually created as a, a multilateral institution by uh, 194 member states. It's, it owes its very existence to the idea of multilateralism, sharing of knowledge, collective responsibility for global health, and collective action to protect it. Um, the work that we do today in every aspect of this response, uh, the work that the partners in the ACT Accelerator are doing around the world uh, speaks to that mandate, it speaks to that responsibility, and one which we take uh, very seriously. Um, and therefore, yes, of, of course, uh, this, this is a time that the Director General's speech speeches time after time. Uh, he's been calling since January, February for solidarity, science, and solutions. And the ultimate expression of solidarity is governments acting together collectively uh, and in a coordinated fashion to solve problems for all our citizens. And, and we uh, very much welcome all of the, uh, the commitments to that that we've seen at the UN General Assembly from many, many countries uh, over the last week. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. We will move now to uh, London to Mr. Borzu Daragahi from The Independent. Can you hear me? Please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. Great. I'm actually in Istanbul. Um, I had a rather broad question about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on global medicine. Can any or, or all of you, if you would like, uh, comment on how the pandemic, in your view, over the last uh, seven, eight months has changed medicine in terms of recruitment, retirement, uh, protocols, and what, if any, patterns uh, have you seen within the medical communities regarding changes? Amnesty said earlier this month that at least 7,000 medical workers have died of COVID-19. Um, I, I don't know if that's a, a total number, but how, have, how, can, how does a, a tragedy like that impact uh, a profession uh, as medical professionals yourselves? Uh, thank you. Um, to respond to your question about the uh, impact on health workers, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Edward Kelly, who is Director of Integrated Health Services at WHO. Ed, Dr. Ed Kelly, you have the floor. Thanks for the question. And the bottom line is that COVID has changed probably forever many things in our societies, but certainly it's changed the delivery of health services. Just last week with uh, Dr. Tedros and a number of people here in the room, we celebrated World Patient Safety Day, the theme being safe health workers, safe patients, to talk about the impact of COVID and not just infections, but the stress uh, and the mental health uh, and also the uh, new ways of working that have forced the medical community to adjust to, uh, to COVID. Right now, in terms of what's reported to WHO, of uh, the healthcare workers in terms of infections uh, the, have been about 14% of all the infections that are reported to us. There's limited data on this, but I think it's highlighted that we need to study more and it's certainly put the spotlight on the fact that uh, reforming and supporting health workers in all aspects, and we're talking about not just care deliverers, but the people who clean the rooms, the people who work in the community in terms of outreach workers, have been majorly impacted. WHO has done a number of studies on this, looking at the essential health services and the continuity of those health services. Uh, there's been an impact across the board uh, in terms of uh, health services. About half of all health services at one point were interrupted, but it's everything from uh, things that can be managed at some way, like dental services and rehab services, down to acute emergency services. So, all countries right now are figuring out ways to make this work. WHO is trying to gather some of those experiences and share them as part of the response. And this will be something that we'll be working on with countries going forward. Thank you, Dr. Kili. I think Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff has something to add. Yes, thank you. I'm going to ask, I'd like to address the first part of the question that you asked, you asked about the bringing together of, of the medicine and how has that changed. 
Um, I think one of the things we've seen, and, and WHO does a lot of work in this area of, of, of convening the world's scientific expertise and the world's um, leading experts on any number of topics that, that we are working on and responsible for, and this pandemic is no different. So quickly, we utilized our uh, networks um, that have been in existence for emerging infectious pathogens like SARS, like MERS, like influenza, and brought that together to um, understand, better understand what we were learning about this virus, around severity, around transmission, about uh, clinical care, about everything that you could think of. Um, and that was no different in this pandemic. Um, but what that really allowed us to be able to do, and, and you've heard me say this to before, we've worked with, we are working with thousands of scientists all over the world and all of these different international networks. But that really helped us to um, be strategic and smart about the type of studies that needed to be done. We had a meeting in early February um, under the R&D blueprint to have a research forum to say what are the critical questions, the critical unknowns that need to be addressed under nine different topics from epidemiology to the animal-human interface to therapeutics um, to virology, all, all IPC, um, so many different topics, and then pushed that science to be done, pushed those studies to be done, um, ensured that we had the right uh, groups doing different types of research and not all doing the same research in one particular area <laughs> and then coming together regularly to discuss and debate, um, review all of the papers that are coming out. Um, and I think that ability to be able to harness that world's expertise, not only to say these are the studies that need to be done, but to drive all the way through saying the, identifying the priorities, outlining the research methodologies that are critical to address those critical unknowns. And we have a number of, of protocols that are out uh, to follow really high level, robust methodology, for everything from seroepi through the clinical trials, um, to be able to get those answers um, uh, quicker. Um, but the science is really accelerating. I mean, nine months, 10 months in, the science is coming fast and furious. And we work through our science division um, that Sumia leads, uh, and with our partners and in, in the science division, but also the Gorin Research Network to review the studies that are coming out every day. And there are preprints that come out every day. They haven't gone through peer review, but there's hundreds of them, if not thousands of them. Um, and the studies are becoming sharper. The studies are becoming more specific. Um, they still need to go through peer review so that, we, so that they go through that process. Um, but we are working to, to pull all of that together and look at our guidance and look at our advice. And that's why our guidance and advice evolves. But I think that's a really good question because this pandemic, again, just accelerates the speed at which WHO and our partners are able to come together and push that even further. So it's a process. Um, science never finishes. Um, you know, it's something that evolves over time and it grows and that's a positive thing and that's why our guidance evolves uh, over time. But we're really grateful for all of our partners doing high quality research, taking the time to do it well, putting it through peer review uh, and making sure that they're, they're addressing these critical unknowns. Thank you, uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Now we, uh, the next question will come from Stephanie Nebehe Reuters. Stephanie? Do you hear me? Yes, thank you, Fadela. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. I wondered if someone could elaborate, please, uh, in terms of what I understood were the 67 countries that have joined, um, the self-financing countries that have joined COVAX with, I think you said, 34 more expected. Could you elaborate as to whether China is among those and whether Taiwan, which today said it had signed up on September 18th, is among those? And um, also, we, just as a corollary, we understand from a Chinese official today that WHO has, quote, supported its um, emergency use of vaccines. It, can you perhaps comment on that, please? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Dr. Bruce Edward. Thanks, Fidela. Yes, so that's correct. Um, Right now, there are uh, an extraordinary number, and it changes every single day in terms of the number of countries that are working with, uh, 
with the uh, countries and economies working with the COVAX facility. Um, as of today, as the Director General mentioned, it's 159 countries that have already confirmed countries and economies that they are going to be part of uh, the COVAX facility. Um, of these, we've got uh, 92 are what we call AMC eligible countries for support. Um, and then we have the 67, what we call self-financing uh, countries and economies. And of those, uh, we have uh, 29 actually have come together through what's called Team Europe. Um, and in addition, there's another 34 that are still in discussion. So the final number could be well over 170 country and economies that are part of this. And yes, indeed, um, Taiwan is uh, one of the economies that have joined the uh, COVAX facility, and uh, which, is, which is great. Um, we're in discussion with China as well about the role that they may play as we go forward in the, uh, with, with the COVAX uh, facility, particularly in terms of the importance as a uh, potential supplier of vaccines on, on the global scale. I think as most people on the call are aware of the, uh, all of the vaccines that are currently now in phase three, um, four of these vaccines are vaccines from China. So again, an important potential player as we go forward. Um, on the specific issue of the emergency use uh, licensure, I think, uh, Marie, uh, Marie Angela. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me emphasize that countries have autonomy according to their national regulations and legislation to issue emergency use authorizations for any health product. And China and other countries have already done so for different products. And WHO has emergency use listing provisions and has issued already several products uh, for diagnostics. We have not yet issued provisions for uh, EOL of vaccines. But today I have good news for you because we have just published, put out for comments, a draft criteria for, uh, for assessment of COVID-19 vaccines for emergency use listing or pre-qualification. And this will help manufacturers understanding the criteria. And also, the, this is uh, up for comments until the 8th of October, public comments, organizations, manufacturers, and individuals, because this will help uh, to all partners to understand what's necessary to put a product that's both safe and effective into the market and what are the elements that will make it eligible for either an emergency use listing by WHO or a pre-qualification. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Simao. Uh, the next question is um, from, I will give the floor to Robin Millard uh, from AFP, Agence France Presse. Uh, Robin, uh, can you hear me? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. The world is approaching one million deaths from COVID-19. Is it unthinkable that two million might die before a vaccine becomes widely available? Thank you, uh, Robin. Dr. Ryan will take your question. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it, it's certainly... Uh, unimaginable, but it's 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 not impossible, because if we look uh, at uh, losing a million people in nine months, and then we just look at the realities of getting vaccine out there in the next nine months, it's a big task for everyone involved. To uh, uh, Mary Angela's just outlined the issues of listing. Uh, there's the issue of scale up. There's the issue of funding these vaccines. There's the issue of distributing these vaccines, and then the issues of acceptance. And on, beyond that. Uh, with uh, the work we still have to do in controlling this disease. And remember, we have things we can do now to drive transmission down and drive down the number of deaths. We're seeing uh, clinical case fatality rates slowly drop. We're seeing doctors and nurses making better use of oxygen, better use of intensive care, the use of dexamethasone, which again was referred to in the DG speech in which act, the ACT Accelerator will provide a lot of focus on, and other therapeutics as they come online. So. Uh, it is, uh, uh, one million is a terrible number, and I think we need to reflect on that before we start considering a second million. There is a lot that can be done to save lives, both in terms of disease control, existing life-saving measures, and the uh, innovations that uh, are, are coming 
uh, down the pipe. The real question is, are we prepared collectively to do what it takes to avoid that number? Are we prepared to fully engage in the surveillance and testing and tracing, in uh, managing our own risks at society and community level, governments supporting communities to take that action? Are we uh, willing to make the investments now that are needed in the ACT Accelerator, especially in COVAX? Uh, because these are the number one, the investments we need to make and the actions we need to take at all levels of our society, both subnationally, nationally, and internationally. Are we willing to take the multilateral action, the collective global action, uh, to, to take control of this virus rather than this virus controlling our destinies? Uh, if we don't take those actions and we don't continue to escalate and uh, evolve the nature and scale and intensity of our cooperation, uh, yes we will be looking at, them, at that number and sadly a number much higher. So the time for action is now on every single aspect of this strategic approach. The DG has said it again, 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 not just this, not just test and trace, not just clinical care, not just social distancing, not just hygiene, not just masks, not just vaccines, do it all. And unless we do it all, the numbers you speak about are not only uh, imaginable, but unfortunately and sadly, very likely. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Um, Dr. Edward has something to add. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for the uh, question, Roban. I think we have to be super clear. Whether another million people die of COVID-19 is not a function of whether or not we have a vaccine. It's a function of whether or not we put the tools and approaches and knowledge that we have today to work to save lives and prevent transmission. It's as simple as that. And if we start thinking about it as a function of the vaccine, people will unnecessarily and unacceptably die as we wait for a vaccine. We should not be waiting. We have made incredible progress in terms of reducing mortality from this disease, in terms of preventing the most vulnerable and the highest risk from getting Getting infected by this disease. It's uh, unacceptable, it's unnecessary, and it should be unimaginable. And it should not be a function of whether or not we have a vaccine. It's a function of whether or not we, as individuals, as Mike emphasized, do what we can, our part, to prevent transmission of this disease. Thank you, Dr. Elward. Um, the next question is, uh from Anna Pinto, Fola de Sao Paulo. Anna, can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Fadila, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, my question is about um, how to talk to younger people. Uh, the European Commission said yesterday that this is the last chance to avoid new lockdowns uh, like those imposed in spring and called for the young people to comply with the physical distance rules and um, protect themselves and protect others. But I guess we have seen that it's not lack of information. So information is not enough to change people's behaviors. So um, since early this month, the WHO convened its uh, special group on behavioral science, I wonder if there are already any insights about the best way or, or the most promising ways to get people to, to really take care of themselves and others, especially younger people who seem to believe that COVID-19 uh, is not such a big deal. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Can, uh, Dr. Ryan? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, I take your point, but again, uh, we run the risk here of, when you say young people, you mean all youth and they're all of the same mind and None of them want to cooperate. I, I, I think that's where the older people get it wrong, quite frankly. The vast majority of young people that I know are just as committed to containing this disease and saving lives as anybody else. In fact, more committed. Uh, just as knowledgeable, as you say. Uh, the issue is when it comes to behavior. You may have the knowledge, you may have that attitude, you may wish to take the best possible um, action. <clears throat> but then it's how you actually behave in the end. And there are many factors that eventually drive human behavior. 
And we have to understand uh, also, and under, uh, not to get into a blaming culture, we have to see how we can support youth, like we support any sector in our society, to protect themselves and protect others. So I, I, I really hope we don't get into a sort of finger wagging, it's all because of the youth, uh, and therefore they need to improve their behaviours, so we need, you know, I, I, that is not a dialogue that is going to work. It certainly never worked with me. Uh, uh, so I, I think we need, uh, we need to have a conversation, and the youth need to lead that conversation. And the last thing a young person needs is an older person uh, pontificating and wagging their finger. So I think we need to find better ways to engage young people. I think we need to <clears throat> give young people the responsibility and give them a voice in this, and then empower them and resource them to do it. But in the end, when we look at some of the situations around the world, if we leave aside who's doing it, the reality is that indoor, closely, um, close together gatherings of individuals engaged in uh, activity, intense activity over a prolonged period of time is a major factor in driving transmission at community level in this epidemic. And therefore, we have to make those environments safer and we have to make behaviour in those environments safer. And it really doesn't matter if it's old people or young people. It is the environment, the context, it is the situation in which the, the, the virus is spreading. It's not the people, it's not because they're young that it's happening. It's not their fault, it's not because it's, the, uh, it, it's about the, the situations in which that is occurring. And the environments in which transmission is occurring is driving transmission. How do we work with young people to make those environments safer, make their behaviour safer? Because some people say to be more responsible, and again you start an argument of who's irresponsible and who's responsible. Let's talk about safe behaviours, and let's talk about making myself safe and others safe. Then it's easier, because people can, I think younger people can internalise that idea, uh, rather than making it about uh, responsibility and, uh, and, and other things that the youth of the world really don't want to hear from older people most of the time. Maria? Thanks, Mike. Um, I think three things we need to do with all people, young people, old people, all people. It's about engagement, it's about empowerment, and it's about enabling them to do what they need to do. And the engagement comes through dialogue, through discussion. It's through listening, it's through talking, it's through constant conversation. Because the pandemic situation is evolving, it's changing, it's complicated, it's scary, it's confusing. It's hopeful, but that dialogue needs to continue to happen with all different groups. Um, we reached out to a number of youth groups to have conversations and dialogues to start that, but that dialogue has to happen at a national level, at subnational level, in communities, in churches, in different types of engagements, at schools. How can we engage and listen and really understand what are the concerns what are, the, what are the considerations that children and, and young adults and young people and old people, everyone can, can, can take so that they know that they can feel empowered to do something to protect themselves. There's so much that we have right now that you can do to protect yourself. Um, and this is all of the individual measures that we've been saying and the hand hygiene and the respiratory etiquette, wearing of masks, avoiding enclosed spaces, um, you know, take a risk-based approach. But then what is it that we can do to provide enabling environment so that individuals can be safe throughout their day? How can workplaces be safer? How can schools be safer? How can public transport be safer? How can your home be safer? Um, how can social different aspects be safer? You know, we say physical distancing, not social distancing. What we're seeing, and, and as Mike said, they are, young people are a force of nature in terms of their ability and passion and creativity to help find solutions. You talk to a group of young people, they don't come to you with a bunch of problems. They come to you with, you know, there's something here, here's a possibility of a solution to think forward. Let's harness that as well, and we're trying to harness that as well. We're trying to all work through what our new normal looks like, and whether we like it or not. Going back to the old ways right now is not gonna happen. We are working towards keeping ourselves safe, finding ways to keep transmission to a low level, while we open up our societies. And there are ways that we're doing that. How can we remain social with our friends but keep physically distant? How can that place where I want to go be safer by improving ventilation through either natural ventilation or other means? How can we reduce the number of people that are there? But I think you know we really need to stop blaming each other on what is wrong 
and work together to find these solutions. There's just no way around it, and I agree, Mike. You know, young people don't want to be told what not to do, don't want to be scolded. Um, the reason we're seeing changes in the epidemiology in terms of the numbers of cases of younger people has to do with a number of factors. It's the surveillance that's different. You know, we're now able to look for more mild end of the spectrum in terms of in surveillance activities. Um, and societies are opening up. And we're, we're learning how to calibrate this keeping suppression low while, while opening up. But listen, you know, young people need to speak up, speak out, hold your leaders accountable, hold us accountable to find these solutions. And we need to work together to be able to do so. Thank you, Dr. Von Kerkhoff. Uh, yeah, Dr. Tedros, please. Yeah, just one issue. I, I think um, I don't want to take much time because we have to move to the... Uh, one thing I just would like to add is um, let's not assume that the number of cases or deaths are uniformly distributed throughout the world. 70% of the number of cases and 70 per, more than 70% of the number of deaths came from 10 countries. So going forward, I think we have to focus on countries that have contributed much to this and how those countries can cut. That could really slash the number of cases and the number of uh, deaths. The number two, as colleagues said, when we started, the unknowns of the virus were more. We didn't know much. Now we know a lot about the virus. Still there are some unknowns, but we know more and we have very effective tools at hand. And Mike had outlined those uh, tools we have, and uh, Bruce too. So we have to implement those uh, tools now while investing in vaccines. And I have also outlined the four um, tools in my, in my speech. So we shouldn't waste time. We should invest in those tools that we have already. I mean, use the tools that we have while investing in vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, we now move to the next question. Uh, Sophie from SABC. Sophie, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, there was a, a hype around how Africa, as usual, uh, the dark continent, as many characterize our continent, even though it's one of the progressive uh, continents right now that uh, there's going to be a catastrophe when uh, we have uh, uh, the cases. But it was not to be. And it looks like there's a concerted effort to try and paint the continent as being faulty in terms of reporting its cases. And people don't believe that we have the numbers that we have as a continent. And perhaps uh, we were proactive to ensure that we don't have high numbers, even though my country, South Africa, had problems and only yesterday numbers went up. What is your message to those people who are continuously uh, doubtful that uh, Africa is uh, playing an important role in the global village on challenging matters and also that it does take uh, advice seriously, particularly the regulations from World Health Organization. Thank you, uh, Sophie. Uh, Dr. Ryan. <clears throat> no, it is, and <clears throat> I think we can uh, look to, to Africa, and yes, certainly the, the reported numbers and most importantly, the reported deaths uh, from Africa are, are low, and they're the lowest, uh, they're the lowest in the world. Uh, we were all very concerned as this pandemic uh, spread around the world. Uh, and you'll remember here at many press conferences, we spoke about our concern for refugees. We spoke about our concerns for people living with HIV. We spoke about our concerns for testing capacity and clinical capacity in many, in many countries. Um, and, but we also spoke about the inherent resilience uh, in Africa. We spoke about 
the maturity of community-based surveillance, of syndromic surveillance in Africa, of collective action, of, and I've certainly said it here personally, uh, because I've had, and Dr. Tedros has two sodas, Bruce, a lot of personal experience in the front line, uh, how adaptable and how creative uh, people, uh, professionals, healthcare workers are in Africa at getting the job done and getting the care that people need, despite rarely having enough resources. Um, so we spoke about both of those, but there was still a lot of concern. We're very pleased that, uh, that in places like South Africa are bringing the disease under control and that we haven't seen this awful impact uh, in people living with HIV. Again, age governments and humanitarian agencies deserve great credit. A lot of work has gone into protecting vulnerable refugee and displaced populations. <clears throat> and, uh, and also Africa benefits from its age distribution. The, the median uh, age, I think, in, in Africa is 17 or 19 years. I mean, 50% of the population are in their teens in Africa. Uh, it gives a, an advantage in terms of the mortality from, from this disease. But Africa hasn't escaped unscathed. There are still many, many deaths, and South Africa had a very severe uh, impact of disease. On the testing front, again, countries in Africa have really accelerated their capacity. We've worked with African countries, uh, our regional director, Dr. Chidi Mueti, and the team, uh, John and Kengazong, and the people at Africa CDC, the reference labs that we built, uh, worked with South Africa and within Senegal, have worked to ensure that all African countries now have uh, a laboratory testing capacity. It is still not completely adequate, but it has increased in availability, and, and testing is much more widespread. But it, there are still many areas outside main cities where testing is not as good as it should be. So there, there still is a phenomenon of under-detection of cases, but it has uh, got better. So overall, yes, we're not out of the woods anywhere, and I would say we're not out of the woods in Africa. The idea that everything is fine and everything is going to remain so, I think we need to be very, very careful. Amer Africa needs to remain on guard, it needs to remain ready, it needs to continue to do testing and tracing and surveillance. Uh, and we continue, uh, and we need to continue to support those countries. The thing, though, and maybe Ed will speak to this, that African countries have suffered in this pandemic beyond the disease is the disruption of other health services, and, the, and, and, and that in itself is having an impact uh, right now and something we need to deal with in terms of recovery of those systems uh, and avoid that uh, negative impact of diversion of health care and diversion of health care uh, services. Um, the DG will will maybe want to speak on, on, on this too, but, but Ed may have some figures uh, on that. So yes, it is not a catastrophe by any means. And I would say, and again, I've said it, Africa has many lessons to teach the world about how to be resilient, how to be creative. I have learned uh, side by side with many of my African colleagues in the front line, and I guarantee you I've learned more than I've ever taught. Uh, and therefore, I think we need to look at the bottom-up approaches in Africa, the way in which responses are localized and communities participate, uh, and the focus of health systems. And I, I know I've, I, many, so many of my African health colleagues, when you talk about a public health problem, the first thing they will say to you is, what does the community think? It's instinctively much more, whereas you talk to northern medical colleagues, we medicalize and we biomedicalize every situation. And the thing I've noticed over my career with colleagues who've been trained and worked in Africa, is that they immediately think about the community dimension as the first thing they think about, not the last thing they think about. And so I think maybe Africa is teaching us a trick or two. But again, don't get me wrong, Africa is not out of the woods. Vigilance is absolutely required. Uh, and we celebrate that Africa has not been hit in the way it could have been, but there are still many countries who may struggle if their systems become overwhelmed. Ed, you may wish to speak about the broader health systems issues. Yeah, just to jump in uh, really quickly, thanks, Mike, for that. With uh, To note this, it's a great question, um, but uh, in many ways it's true for all countries that the, the toll uh, for uh, the services that were interrupted and the services people weren't able to get um, may end up far outstripping in almost all countries uh, the, the toll from COVID. Eventually we will see that, but certainly in Africa, you look at service capacity, um, and uh, the health workforce. In some countries, WHO has talked about the, the shortage of the healthcare workforce globally. Many countries realize that they have uh, surge capacity issues over the course of the uh, last months. In Africa, 
some countries are looking at two physicians for 100,000 people. So the idea that you can then uh, continue to provide services while also trying to concentrate on this new disease and track and trace uh, is very difficult with a workforce capacity like that. The impact on health services was higher and the interruption on health services was higher in Africa than in other regions, only behind uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region where we saw in Africa about 60% on average of services were disrupted. But also though, there's, as Mike was saying, there's incredible stories and a history, recent and current history with dealing with outbreaks while they're also delivering services to their populations. I have a very good friend, Francis Cate, who's chief medical officer in Liberia. He gave a great interview early on in the outbreak where someone said, well, how is it that Liberia's been able, a country quite poor with very poor service capacity, able to handle this um, major outbreak that's brought other countries to their knees? And he said, well, we, had a, we have a very simple three-pronged strategy. We're testing as many people as we can. We are tracing every contact we have, and every single day we adjust our strategy. And it's a lesson for other countries. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kelly. Dr. Tedros? Just one thing I would like to add. I don't want to, because Mike and uh, Ed have already uh, said everything that has to be said. One, one thing I would like to add is um, Africa is a continent. Africa is not a country. So there are differences between countries on how they handle even COVID or other, th other things. So when we uh, analyze, it's really important that we see country by country. In Europe, by the way, the same thing, because even in Europe, it's one continent, but <laughs> the uh, response to COVID varies significantly between from one country to the, to the other. Uh, so um, uh, checking that will be very important because there are five, 55 countries in Africa and it's a continent, and there will be variations. And I would actually urge that we uh, check country uh, by, by country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Um, let's move now to uh, BN Kumar, Bees News Connect, India. Um, Mr. Kumar, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, we have been talking a lot about the collective responsibility, collective working, etc., for the COVID vaccine. I would like to know what is the uh, latest update on the joint action that, to find out the source of the virus that was supposed to have taken place in China, and WHO de delegation was now supposed to be in China working on that. I'm asking this question, which must have been answered earlier, in the context of uh, one Chinese virologist who came out and has been giving lots of interviews to media, saying China has deliberately planted. It is, though WHO says it is not man-made, uh, this virology says it is not lab, it is, it is lab-made. I want to... Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, Dr. Mike, if you can answer this question. Sure. Uh, WHO has been working actually since early February on the whole issue of the animal human the breach in the, the the animal origin and the animal human species breach going right back to the first research uh, meeting actually that uh, Sumia oversaw myself and others in in February and in fact we have identified the animal human origin as one of the key pillars of research uh, same status as vaccination and many other things uh, working groups were established uh, at that time. The groups subsequently met again, I think, in June, July, um, and again uh, looked at progress and advances in understanding of the animal models, the, the origins of disease, the different work that was going on around the world in different countries, um, and again updated the research roadmap for the, uh, the animal-human interface. We've worked very closely with FAO, uh, with OIE and other partners uh, on, that, uh, on that agenda. In parallel to that, and uh, we've been working uh, closely with uh, colleagues in China to uh, establish a, a research plan for the uh, studies to look at the animal origins of uh, disease uh, in China. 
And uh, as you know, we had uh, the DG dispatched uh, an advanced team to China that worked with our country office and with the Chinese authorities to define a terms of reference and then effectively a roadmap to the kinds of studies that we would need in order to understand the animal-human origin. That would not just be animal studies, but that would be epidemiologic studies, animal studies, environmental studies that would be needed to, to understand the animal origin. Um, and uh, all investigations uh, were on the table. That was planned in, in two phases. Uh, phase one focusing on the epidemiologic uh, history of the disease, identifying to what extent we can identify the case zero. And I've said here at previous uh, meetings, the case zero may not be in Wuhan. We know that we've had the uh, cluster of cases around the Wuhan seafood market, but we know we had antecedent cases. So the first thing, if you're going to look at animal origin, you really have to identify the case zero or the case zeros, those human beings that you believe were infected from the animal source. Once you know that, you can start to look at that animal source and the likely candidates for that having happened. And, and that will be very much those animal studies in a phase two. Um, the Chinese authorities themselves are conducting phase one studies um, and we have communicated with them intensively over the last uh, number of weeks. Maria may speak to that um, in identifying a multidisciplinary team that will work with our Chinese colleagues. Uh, we have shared um, uh, details of those we believe to be um, uh, excellent scientific candidates. We've reached out to external partners, including partners in the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, uh, looking for uh, specific individuals, uh, not specific, sp individuals that would meet the specific terms of references in the area of epidemiology, laboratory, veterinary science, animal human origin studies, and, and, and others. And uh, we would hope very soon to conclude a final agreement on a, a deployable team that can uh, visit China to work with our colleagues there on advancing phase one and phase two studies. Maria, anything to yeah, add? Just briefly to add that, that it may take some time. So just in our experience with other zoonotic pathogens and viruses, the pathogens that jump from an animal to, to human, um, and finding the animal source or the intermediate source, it takes some time. Um, you know, in our experience with, with MERS coronavirus, it took us over a year to find the, the host, which is the dromedary camel. And those came from detailed studies that were done um, with humans and with in the environments where they lived and looked. And these come from very detailed investigation studies that are done, research studies that are done. Um, and as Mike has said, having that multidisciplinary approach and coming at it from all different types of angles is what scientists do when they do research. They, they bring together the virologists and the anthropologists and the people at the animal-human interface and veterinarians and, and others to just think through what may be the types of hypotheses. We did that for MERS. We did that for SAR, the first SARS uh, virus. Um, and we do that for Ebola. Um, and looking at, in the history of trying to find the animal origin or the intermediate host, that does take some time and it does take research and it takes um, dedication to be able to look for that. So as Mike has outlined, it's something that we uh, and the global community has, has identified as a, as a critical thing to do, um, as, a, as a focus of focused research. We're working with our Chinese counterparts. Even in, in February when, when Bruce and I were there, um, working with our counterparts, that was identified as, as well as, as, a, as a priority um, to be able to determine. Because what's important from the public health perspective is if you don't know what the animal source is, if you don't know what the intermediate source is, it can happen again. And so there are so many scientists that are working at what we call the animal-human interface. And essentially, this is an entire discipline and disciplines of people that study these viruses that circulate in, in animals and different animal populations and look at their potential. These are other viruses, their potential to spill over. And so there's a whole body of, of, of research that's out there and we're constantly looking what the next one the next one may be. So it may take some time, but we are working very closely with our Chinese counterparts, as Mike has said, uh, to advance the, the research in this area. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. No, I just wanted to add one part. I think Mike and um, Maria uh, have already uh, said it, but just one, one aspect. WHO believes in science and evidence, and that's why we say science, solutions, and solidarity. And our colleague, I think the person who asked from uh, uh, India, said 
you know, there was a media uh, interview, uh, someone saying that the virus came from a lab. Um, but as far as we are concerned, and so far, as, you know, all the publications we have seen, the publications say it's actually uh, something, the virus has happened naturally. It came naturally. So these are all the publications we know. And if there is anything that will change this, it should come through the proper scientific process. You know, whoever comes to the media and speaks, we cannot say anything. We would urge them, actually, to go through the scientific uh, process, because here, science and evidence should be uh, central. Um, and that's what we have to uh, up, up, uphold. We cannot comment, we cannot say anything on whatever is being said uh, in the media. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to Kostas Davanis from ERT Greece. Kostas, do you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Uh, hi. Um, hi. My question is, how do you assess uh, the current situation with the coronavirus in Europe? Do we have the, the second wave? and? Can this uh, second wave be more dangerous as the first in the March? Uh, thank you, Kostas. Dr. Von Kerkhoff, if you can take this question, please. So thanks, Kostas. That's a good question. So um, as Tedro, Dr. Tedros has said, Europe is many countries, and so we're, we, we need to not overgeneralize what's happening in every country in Europe. Um, what we look at at an individual country level is the trends and what is happening in each of the countries. Um, the trends as it relates to their surveillance uh, policies, their testing policies, and other policies that I, they have put in place to be able to suppress transmission. Um, and we are seeing in a number of countries right now uh, an increasing trend in cases. And part of that is due to the fact that we have better surveillance and so countries are in a much better position now to be able to detect cases. But what is worrying to us is an increase in hospitalizations and an increase in bed occupancy for hospitalizations and also in ICU. Um, we're at the end of September, not even towards the end of September, and we haven't even started our flu season yet. So what we are worried about um, is the possibility um, you know, that these trends are going in the wrong direction. Now, on the other hand, we are in a much different situation now than, we, than we were in a few months ago. We have tools in place to be able to reduce transmission and to save lives. So the hospitalization rates that we're seeing now are not at the same level as we were seeing in March, April, May. But we wanna make sure that those hospitalization rates stay low and that transmission is still brought under control because societies are opening up. Um, and so what countries are doing is they're, they're, doing a, they're using a data-driven approach from the data that they are collecting from cases, looking at case numbers, looking at hospitalization rates, looking at ICU capacity, looking at the different types of transmission that is happening. Is it happening, where is it happening? Is it happening in clusters? Is it happening at homes? Is it happening in the communities? And then taking deliberate 